guys going to start? Whatever you prefer. It's, it's dealer's choice around here, man. All right, cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. My name is Danny Zastro. Uh, my colleague over here, Matt Batten, uh, best friend. We were both in the Marine Corps together, uh, stationed in North Carolina for about five years-ish. So, you know, doing things. <laughs> and uh, we are going to be doing our talk on movement after initial compromise. So, this is us, DEFCON over here on the left side, you know, enjoying ourselves more than going to talks. <laughs> what in Vegas, right? <laughs> um, and so my background, um, right now I am working for a Mayo Clinic. Uh, we are on the team for um, basically doing all the security testing for Mayo apps as well as the apps that they bought um, across the enterprise. So it's a whole slew of pen tests against systems, as well as red teaming operations, and then also the vulnerability management for Mayo itself. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big workload, and there's about eight or nine of us, and then we also get help from outside, so it's quite a bit of stuff. Um, and then, you know, when I'm not at work, I am hanging out with my dog most of the time, <laughs> as y'all can see, and he basically is always there, no matter what I'm doing. And, when I'm trying to work on my computer, he is right there where my keyboard should be. <laughs> so, um, I'm a big Star Wars fan, and unlike what my friend put up there on the beginning, I am not a Rebel fan. <laughs> <laughs> I did that this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so, and Matt Patton? Oh. All right, so my name is Matt Patton. My annual sleep zero. That means like interactive mode, you know, sleep zero, interactive, you know, sleep and jitter, right? Yeah. Nerd <laughs> games. <laughs> <laughs> I got that handle. I got the handle because they're in the op. I actually did sleep zero. I'm super like ADD on ops, and I just want to get stuff done. And I got caught, said stuff. Uh, I have my GitHub. A lot of stuff I work on now, I actually can't put on my GitHub, unfortunately. So um, I work for the government a lot. And uh, the company I work at, Six Gen, uh, the CEO and the operators I work with are like the best in the business. They really are. I've never learned so much from such qualified individuals. And Everyone brings their own unique capabilities, and they're just honestly the best operators I've ever worked with. And I don't want to go anywhere else. I've never been so happy in the job or loved the job so much. And they really helped me grow every day. So like, it's hard to say that. It's like my seventh job since I got in the Marine Corps, and I don't want to go anywhere else for any anything. But uh, Mary, there's my wife. She's right here. So I love that picture of her right there. We got married in May. That's us, we're best friends, right? Marine Corps, you said that. That was us when we were dating Marines. We were chilling together. That's her hugging RTV2 at DEF CON. And then there's me with my cat, where I probably should be working. I'm not. All right. All right, so, so what we're going to cover, so it's called Movement After Initial Compromise. So we're going to talk about, like, once you first compromise a box on a company network, what do you do? What do you look for? How do you move, right? So lateral movement, we're going to go over a bunch of techniques to do that. Port forwarding. So that's you know masking traffic through another system. So people don't know who you are because you want to do it from your attack machine. Um, so we'll talk about like, you know some reverse port forwarding from VPSs and burning and stuff like that, right? We won't go too deep in that because we're not doing infrastructure. So if you want to nerd out after, feel free. Uh, so tradecraft, <coughs> a lot of the stuff on here, it's it is very useful and a lot of networks they'll still work on, but the most up to date stuff. Um, some some of the things I can't go over and talk about. I'll talk about some C sharp implants and stuff. But a lot of the other things I actually am not going to disclose to you guys that I do personally, and our company does, because if I tell you all, then work gets out and I can't do it anymore. And if I worked with a company, I obviously would, you know, non disclosure agreements, we'll talk about it when we fix everything. And we'll talk about tools that are being used today. And I love the office. That's Dwight. All right, cool. All right, so set and stage. You already compromised the system, utilizing the preferred method. Uh, I pulled out a bash button while he's talking, because I didn't pull it out, I forgot. So a lot of times CAT teams, right, close access teams, physical access teams, and or phishing campaigns will be your initial uh, callback. So you can lie to the secretary, say you're a compromised box, you have, or box, you have SMTP, and then you would tell them, hey, who's the person that needs to email you to give me access? They'll say the name, like you have a business card to give you it, which actually has your email. You're at SMTP, say you're a compromised something, then you can actually very easily send an email as that user to the front desk, and then they'll give you access to the server. It's not hard. This access thing is not hard either. You just wear a very legit shirt and a badge and talk to people, and then they usually let you in. And calling ahead is huge. But, and it's, I love cats. 
He's in the computer, still in the data. It's awesome. All right. All right, so first things first, who am I? Right? Very deep question. And that's the first question you should ask when you either call that or shell, right? I call it beacons a lot. I work with Cobalt Strike a lot. If anyone knows what it is, it's a C2. Yeah. So it's a C2, so like I work with Mesploit, like Empire, stuff like that. So I, I know the other ones as well, but I'm very heavy in Cobalt Strike. I write, you know, I do aggressive scripting, stuff like that. The automate a lot. But who am I? So as soon as shell comes back, are you allowed to be on that box? Is this IP within range? Uh, definitely check that. I've failed tests for certifications and other places for just running ahead and not reading the documentation. In real life, I never would fail that because I actually checked it the test I have. Um, where am I in this network? So like, are you in a VLAN? Are you, are you cut off? Are you segmented? Uh, do the research. Find out where you are, where you want to move. Don't just go crazy. Obviously, get off that box if you can to another one. You don't, you're going to get burned if you stay on the box you compromise. Mm -hmm. But can you move to another system with your current permissions? Kind of said that. Can I get privileged escalation on my current compromise system? I put can I get system, that's not always your end goal. So system's the highest level on the box that you're on, but can you privilege escalate to some other type of user in the box? What processes are running? Can you eject into them? Stuff like that. And we're gonna cover we're gonna cover that later as well. So up here, put some commands that we use just to you know run it in a command prompt window uh, for just you know figuring out who you are, where you are, who's around you. Um, some ones that I want to bring your attention towards are the net group domain admins slash domain. And if you're working, you know, in a company that has domain admins uh, on the enterprise, then you're gonna be able to get them all listed out there um, that have logged into that box. Um, you're gonna also see the uh, net show and NetS firewall, firewall show rules for learning all of the uh, in and out and uh, dynamic and static rules that are configured on that machine. So you're gonna be able to see what kind of traffic can come in, what can go out, and how it's set and who set it. Um, Netstat pack A and O is gonna give you all of the processes that are communicating into and out of that uh, box right there. Um, it would be really nice if you already have a local admin account and you can throw attack B on there as well. Um, that will list out what executable is actually running the listening or sending traffic across. And ANO is, is active, numerical, and process ID. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <coughs> now, without uh, having a domain admin, uh, the closest you're going to be able to get to be able to figure out what executables <coughs> are talking is if you go ahead and throw up a task list, and then you filter by the PID. And then that way, then you'll be able to see what process ID is talking and kind of, you know, rule, figure out you know, okay, what executable is this? So you can kind of get around the fact that you aren't local admin on that computer and still get the same information from, you know, lesser privileged uh, commands. What's that? Yeah. Living off the land. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love pictures. <laughs> pictures make my day, whatever. So uh, I kind of went over um, task list uh, slash SVC um, before, but that's going to be the services that are running on the box. Um, ARPTAC A is going to have all the uh, network uh, information with it again as well. And then route print um, is particularly important because while you can't add or delete routes on the computer without having local admin uh, permissions on that box, you can still see if there's any hard-coded interfaces that traffic is going to be sent in and out of. So, you know, that's kind of good to know if, okay, um, only we're only communicating over, you know, Wi-Fi for uh, certain traffic versus um, the Ethernet jack from the computer. Um, and up here, we have uh, some of those uh, commands listed out and showing the output. Um, this is going to be uh, on the box through so like to yeah. point out, so like the shell commands or cd.exe is running. So that's what shell means. It's running. So like if you're in on your local box, all these commands without the word shell would be the same thing. But their cobalt strike shell runs the cmd.exe. Sorry. So and again, you know, we're listing uh, more output here. Uh, next start, we've got all the uh, services that are started on that computer. And then the local group slash domain information popping up. It's gonna show you you know, all the aliases for joker and .com up here, which is kind of going to be our test environment that we have. <coughs> it's all Batman and cats. <laughs> yeah. um, so, and again, we're showing uh, firewall state up here, and then uh, the uh, traffic coming in and out of the box. 
um, over there. And then over here, I also put uh, the command to check uh, for the process ID with Pacifus, just so you can correlate uh, process ID with executable without having any kind of admin permissions on the box. And that, that goes a long way for process IDs and everything for checking when you first compromise the system. Um, a lot of teams, you know, like you can create an executable, like run something under another one. And in their reality, like in Cobalt Strike, they have PPID, which you can, do, you can actually select the parent process. So, like um, in the last talk, which was really useful, like PowerShell, catching PowerShell, it's like getting very prevalent. So, like you can actually specify you want to utilize export.exe, exe's PID or parent PID. So, when you run an unmanaged PowerShell, say utilizing PowerPID, it actually It'll execute an unmanaged PowerShell instance to run the command that you want, and execute an explorer.exe under the parent kit explorer.exe. So then you're logging on your stuff, most likely you won't catch it. Or could, I mean, depending on your process tree. And then and there's a bunch of stuff that goes in that, like, CMD, you're like, well, every cd.exe and PowerShell.exe are logging captures. But really, who, like, depending on your tools, like, can I copy cd.exe and rename it for your process tree list? Oh, well, we catch that. Do you, can I link it to the executable? Oh, we catch that. Can you, I create a C++ library that actually doesn't use cmd.exe to run whatever I want? Probably, definitely, 100% probably. Yeah, that's like it. But anyways, all right, fair enough. So again, we have uh, the uh, route print information here. Um, that's gonna go ahead and show you uh, where all the hardcoded routes are sending and what interfaces they're on. Um, you'll have to throw up uh, IP config on your computer as well just to kind of figure out what um, interfaces those actually are, like what kind, um, but that IP config slash all will give you that information. Um, so you can kind of tie it to, to take that yep. So taskless SVC. So we'll strike this PS, so process. So you're going you're gonna to drop the process and look at them. A lot of times, uh, not on this, obviously, but if you PS on the full strike, and you can actually do other flags, but you can see the architecture of the target that you're, you're going after. So, if I want to do persistence, say service executable, with you know, I would I run a task list on the target, but then I would see the architecture, and then I would know whether to do a 32 or 64 uh, bit executable on the target. Um, a lot of things else, like people people inject in other processes. So like once I execute on a target, if I have permission to move off that target, I'm going to move off that target immediately. I'm going to go to another one, and I'm going to inject into a process that's already running that I know won't mess anything up or kill anything, right? And, uh, so a lot of people, they just look for new cmd.exe's or powerful.exe's or whatever, but it's not going to necessarily be there, especially once I move around enough. All right, dark query. So you can actually dump all the drivers. You can carry it out to do a .csv, which is super useful for later uh, post-exploitation if you're having issues. So you can do a dark query and you can list all these out, dump them to CSV, and then later on try to see if there's any way you can exploit anything that you want. So <clears throat> RTAC-A, Azure Flow Resolution Protocol. So this is your cache. Uh, table is super important for when you want to move around. So when you first compromise the system, you can do RTAC A. A lot of people, um, there's there's a lot of ways to look around, but RTAC A is probably my favorite to immediately see what systems that, that one normally talks to uh, set. So your environmental variables, a lot of them are shown here. Uh, the main reason, you can't really see it, it's super small, but the main reason I use set, the one, actually like, yeah, the main reason I use set is to see the logon server for the VC, the main controller so. If I type in set, the first thing I'm gonna do is look at logon server, and most likely I know the VC, and that's, I want to move to that. Obviously, I'm not going to do like I'm probably not going to do persistence or sit on it, but I'm definitely going to I'm going to go on there as uh, elevated permissions and our system if I can. And I'm just going to dump hashes and login passwords. Maybe we'll go to maybe cats later, but um, maybe Craig won't take it, but probably not. Um, so schedule tasks, so schedule tasks. I don't know why it looks like that, but what's out the schedule tasks and all this? It shows you it's verbose, so it shows you what it's running under, what it's running as, right? So you know what's currently running the system just for situational awareness. And when you want, if you create a schedule task, things we do is like create descriptions and make it blend into your environment. So you look at other schedule tasks, and it's the same thing with services, right? So if each service has a description, and I create a service on a target, and I don't give a description, and I don't name it the same as the other ones, then will I get flagged? But when you like physically manually notice that, you're like, yeah, this is. And a lot of people when they create services on the target, they don't give a description. If you can remotely give them descriptions and make it blend in. Um, and usually I just rename other service that's already there or whatever, and then I just rename it the same thing or close to it, and I just add one more letter and then, and then time stomp it. Which, time, if people know, so time stomp, I, I can't just say that. Time stomp modifies the time, the time stamp on, so if I put a file on target and say the desktop, and there's other files on there, I can time stomp that file with another file on the desktop, and it'll actually match 
the uh, modification. I forget what it, it's three it's three letters. It's an acronym. I can't think of it right now. But it modifies it so that if you check the date and time, it'll actually match that of the other file. So like a lot of times when you're like, oh my computer's acting weird, you do task manager, you do date and time. The first thing you see, you're like, that's you know, some of there, right? So then and then you delete it. You're like, ha, oh, gosh, you hacker. But this will run it. All right. Yeah, sorry. Just rambling. <laughs> I guess I like stuff, right? All right, so disrespect you surround. I love you. I always do that. This is the first time. I've but anyway, so who am I, right? Deep questions. So like, it's like get you ID, right? My name's so everybody knows. So same thing. Who am I? And like, you can flag that immediately, right? So why, like, why are admins running who am I when they're on a box? So that's being flagged super often. And no one, and no, but no one. A lot of companies aren't utilizing that, which I don't understand. Like, if somebody's running who am I, like, you're the admin, you just logged in, man. What are you doing? You <laughs> <laughs> know who you are. Unless you know? are the script. <laughs> that should give you a way. And that's like the first command everyone in the world runs. And you probably like the best hacker. Like, you probably immediately just a red team or whatever. You're just like, hey, it's never hacker. Like, dumb. But the first person, that's what you run. So this is, again, environmental variables when you do echo commands, right? So echo log on server, Joker, that's my PC. It's called Joker. And then echo username, boom. Uh, yeah, no, so one thing also um, is that it's very hard for some companies, especially if you compromise like a desktop, laptop that's in your environment, it's very hard for huge organizations to be able to grab all of the logs from all of those desktops and then be able to pull that into logging, you know, to be able to look for stuff like that. So if you're doing that, you know, on a DC, well, you probably have logging on your DCs, and if you don't, you got bigger issues going on. But a lot of times, you know, if you have logging turned on on your desktop, it doesn't go anywhere. Like until, you know, you have a forensics team digging into the laptop and being like, all right, did it all originate from here? Then, it, you know, you start seeing it, but, you know, it's just, you're not gonna get, you know, ahead of the problem, uh, usually with the desktops. Yeah, we have skewed perspective. He's like more, he's a lot on the defensive side and more on the offensive, so he's better at stuff like that. So I was like, do better. He's like, it's not that easy, idiot. <laughs> 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 yeah, the red team is awesome because I'm just like, you didn't catch me, I'm awesome. They're like, great job. I'm like, you caught me, you're awesome. Great job. <laughs> so we get paid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> whatever. But, uh, so DS query. So this is actually, I didn't have this in the slides before, and I didn't realize how powerful uh, this could utilize. So obviously, uh, it would get flagged as a low on most companies. Uh, for monitoring DS queries, you have to run this in the main control. You can run on the host, um, if you upload a few things, but on the main control are DS queries. And um, utilizing this, it kind of blew my mind. With, and it gets in like, and I wrote over here, which gets, it gets kind of nerdy, and your brains are going to be like exploding a little bit, go back home and Google it. It did for me anyways, my brain exploded. But um, you can do, so this is like really small, so I'm, I don't know if you can see this over here. But if you, so you can do DS query, and you can filter, and there's object classes. And there's a bunch of object, class, object classes. You can do a uh, wildcard mask there, a star, if you don't know them all, right? Cancel all this out to star. If you don't know something, do a wildcard mask, a list them. Three, the three most likely ones you use is a user, computer, and a trusted domain, okay? Those are the three is a hacker, right, teamer, right? But this one's like one most useful for me. I, it blew my mind when I first found out through some really smart operators. So really smart people teach me, and then I'm just getting smarter, so I'm still really dumb, but these guys are awesome. So, DS query, you star, tech filter, and this is all one line, and this is in command prompt, right? And you can do, but you can do a C plus plus library, and you can make this so it's not just cmd.exe, so it won't fly. It actually won't fly, and if you copy cmd.exe and you run this, it actually won't fly as low at all as you run on DC, right? It's a lot of information, talking a lot, it's on YouTube, I guess, but whatever, I think it's important. So you do DS query, Walker Mass filter, and then this is called a compound, right? Nerd now? All right, cool. Compound, object class equals user, so I'm doing the user class, right? And then admin account equals one. So what does that mean? It means that user was added to a privileged account. And later on, actually, if they get taken out of the privileged account, it still equals one, which is really stupid. I don't know why, but I Googled it, and that's what it says. So um, object class equals user, admin account equals one, and you do same account name. Which you can wildcard mask this too. If you take out same account name and you wildcard mask that, it'll list out all the attributes. And then so you can run this and put a star, and then it'll just list out everything. You'll see all the admin accounts, and it'll say everything about each user. But as a hacker, this is crazy useful. Because I would, as soon as I get on target, I would go, okay, this is where this is where it gets really cool for other people with multiple domains, okay? And I think this is super important. So you, you get on a box, you compromise it, you get to the DC, you're on the DC, and then I would run this, right? And I'm just saying account name, I drop all those users. All right, I already dumped creds on that DC. 
So I did login passwords with many cats. We'll go to many cats later. But I have clear text credentials. Okay. So I see I see all these users. I have passwords of all these users. But I'm trying. So I do. So I do this again. DS query set text star filter. And instead of everything, I just do object class equals trusted domain. I can do I can do a compound and do flat name equals star. So I or I only I only want flat names. So if I list out, now I know all the DCs that have trust. So two or three, right? So it goes one, two, or three. So I know DC or domains that have uh, trust, trust with the or the domain I'm on, not DC. Trust with the domain I'm on, the other domains. So then once I know there's trusted domains, I can run this command with admin accounts. So I'll do this on the, the domain control I'm currently on. I have a list of users who have privileged just like or privileged accounts. Then I would do the tag D, I'll go to limit. I would do the tag D and the domains that are trusted with me, and I would dump users at all the other accounts. Now, imagine like, my name is Matt.Batten, so imagine I have a Matt.Batten.ea on the domain I'm on, and they see a Matt.Batten on the other domain. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if he reuses his passwords, which I definitely do, and I shouldn't. And I do this. So it's, like, it's really bad. I, yeah. I, it's so horrible. Like, you know, I'm fixing that. We're all guilty of that. Right. Right. So I'm very honest. Not for work. Right? Not for work. Yeah. For my personal Never professionally. Life. Yeah. yeah, my personal life, I could, like, I, you know, I start using key pass stuff like that. But it's true. And then the main thing is, like, when you're doing this and you're playing with it and you're not sure what you're running, you will kill your shell if you just run these without doing a limit if you don't know your attributes. So, like, we're filtering out admin account equals one and the user in the same account name. So I'm only listing the same account names. But if you do the log card mask a lot, you need it to like, if you did this and you did the user and admin account equals one and you want to make sure it works and it doesn't just filter out a bunch, you just do tech limit one. So when it runs, if it comes out, then you know it worked. So then you can just run on everything. But if it comes out, it doesn't work, then you know you, know, you need to fix your syntax, whatever. Here. That was okay. a lot. That so was a lot of why, why does that matter? Because mergers, mergers happen all the time. You got telecom companies doing mergers. You have, you know, uh, insurance companies, financial companies. They'll do this, and their IT will be completely different on each side of the shop. You know, and so we see issues with this. And then when they bring it all together, who's in charge? Well, probably the company that bought, you know, the other company out. So how do they pick up the pieces of the shambling, you know, IT infrastructure over on the other side? You know, they quick, you know, they try to, you know, get accounts set up, they try to get everything moving, they just want everything to be up because availability is money. That's all companies care about is money. And security is only there so that they're not the next Equifax or Target or that's, whatever. That's not in the slides, yeah. if you want to picture that. These, it's in here, but the, that one's not in the slides. Oh, um, so also kind of wanted to preface all of the PowerShell stuff that we're talking about now. Um, we did a lot of this talk uh, back in November, December time frame. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, so before, PowerShell was amazing. You literally do anything with it, anywhere, and not get caught as long as you get to PowerShell EXE. It was beautiful. I mean, all, all uh, companies really could do is they could block PowerShell EXE or CMD.exe. But how do you get around that? You know, you just name another application that does the same stuff as CMD or PowerShell and you just run through all that. Boom, you're good, you got it around. Now, what Windows is doing is they started using AMSI, so anti-malware scan interface. And it's horrible for offensive people. Kind of sort of, kind of sort of. So you can get around it by you know, disabling AMSI or by patching over it. Um, disabling it on a local box, though, it requires you to already be a local admin on that box kind of annoying because you already are a local admin, you really have to do that, you know, it's kind of a, you know, which route you want to take. Um, but the problem with AMSI, why it's, you know, tripping up so many red teamers right now, is that it is taking all the input into the PowerShell window, checking that input to see what it will do, how it works, you know, even when you're putting strings together and then running that PowerShell command, it's already looking at that, seeing, hey, this looks bad, I don't want this to happen, and it kills it right there. And you're like, well, that was awesome. Like, I really got somewhere with that. But, and that's all in memory. Like, that's the problem. It's like, you're still not touching disk doing this, but you're still getting caught. There's, there's, there's a thing now where if you get admin permissions, you can actually create an exclusion list on the target remotely for Windows Defender. So exclusion directory to drop your stuff in, but you have to get admin permissions. So, uh, it's pretty cool, it's like MP something. Like it. Yeah, that's like follow up. There's some session. 
All right, so PowerUp is part of the uh, PowerSploit uh, package. And what you're going to be able to get with it is basically finding different ways to uh, drop PowerShell on boxes, again, you know, disregarding AMSI from the previous slide. And you're going to be looking for ways to uh, escalate privileges on that box. You might be talking too fast for the video. Since I'm blind, you can't really read the video right now. Just importing the PS1? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's normal from the other way. Yeah. 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 So if you look at the top, it's a dot 12. So that's our callback. So that's our target. It's dot 12. We're trying for this one. Utilizing power up. So it's going to run a bunch of checks. Sorry, I was going to get it. So it's going to run a bunch of checks. So it's going to look for unquoted service paths, right? So there's spaces and stuff. People don't know what that is, right? What? So it's not quoted, and there's spaces. So it's like, if it's like A, 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 Matt, or A, 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 space Matt, and I wrote A, 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 and then it's gonna call mine over yours, because it's not, it's not quoted, there's a space there, and it's not, it's, it's like in Linux, if you work with Linux, it's quoted out. Wow. So you, you'll see that as well in the registry. If you look at the applications, and that's, um, if you're using vulnerability scanners, a lot of times that'll check the registries on those machines, and look through the applications that are installed and be like, hey, like there's spaces here and it's not quoted out or you know, something like that. So that will be able to check and see this. But yeah, you'll be able to see this uh, in the registry mainly to be able to tell if you have to do it. Like on the 10.xml, the Panther, right? People image. I have a lot. People, people, the admins don't care. Especially like, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Can't talk about it. All right. Go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and I, again, you know, power up, you're basically, you know, creating a self deleting batch file that is then going to be able to, you know, elevate your privileges on that account. And it's super easy as long as you have to deal with, like, AMSI. And, you know, you basically run it and you're good. And all of a sudden, so. So this is something that um, I did some research on, I figured out. So this is a C sharp implant that you put on target. So this code, so this is a link, right? The slides are gonna be published later. This is a virus toll. Oh, why'd you put it on virus toll, idiot? Because this obviously is a my implant, right? And mine mine still doesn't get flagged for that. All right. And um, but C sharp implants, right? PowerShell's not capturing, it's using .NET framework, um, MSI and everything. You're you're trying to you're trying to go under the radar. And this is that this was published by them and I took it and I modified it and now I still don't get flagged. Super useful. I'm not going to post on my GitHub or give you all because it's, especially if you're like imagine integrating that with Metasploit or Cobalt Strike, how cool is that? And that's super good and everyone uses it, it's all until you get caught. Yeah. Right. So you don't use it, right? <laughs> it's a good next one. Um, and this, so I did an advanced scan. I have it on the desktop, I believe. So it's called Console App Port because I was lazy in Visual Studio and they didn't change the name. And uh, I think I did this in November, December. I can't remember. I did November, December. So did an advanced scan. On just that implant that came out on GitHub, right? He posted it, or he posted it on his website and then put it on GitHub. And then uh, completely up to date, advanced scan, nothing, sitting on the desktop, go to the next one, and then start it. So this is a video, so this is my uh, attack machine on the right, and that's the victim on the left, right? So I'm just showing who am I, I'm Root, uh, this is a dot six, and this is a dot 12, I'm showing I'm Batman, everything's Batman related. It's my, it's my network at home, it's my it's flat. Sure. <laughs> yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> right. But um, so I set my listener. <laughs> so my listener is four four three, right? Uh, so I'm listening on uh, my attack machine, and I'm just going to double click that. Boom! I got a shell. And like, and everything's on. All the Windows Defender, everything's on the the compromised machine of the host. It's Windows 10, completely up to date. All the AV stuff, whatever. That's just, and I, the whole reason I put this is just like, because everything I'm talking about, you're like, well, now get flagged in my blog. So some of the my places can't get hacked. And it's like, dude, like, so, if somebody wants to and they haven't, like, am I going to use my C-sharp implant that I made that's custom to this? No, I won't, probably not, unless it has to be like a high value target and whoever I work for at the time or whatever, they need to, you know, we need results. And everything's getting flagged. All the other avenues, because we want to test, usually for red team and pen testing events, you want to test people what normally would happen. Not super custom, high tailored, expensive stuff, right? And like, I'm still an idiot, so it's just like one cool thing I made that works, which is awesome. But, yeah, next one. All right, and then we're, we're going to limit 
This is me. Sorry, this is like remotely executing. So, right, remote code execution is remote. So, sorry. Anyways. Uh, when I, so, this is actually the command that you're going to run uh, shovel make node and the target IP process call create. I'm calling the executable that I put on target. So, we're showing lateral movement utilizing limit, right? Um, so there's turtle and one is system 32 on the target. So this is like after you compromise it, you drop an EIC in the system 32 and you just leave it there. I would say I wouldn't name it turtle. All right, it wouldn't be turtle. I would time stop it and I'd, I'd, I'd uh, name it something similar to another um, executable on target. But this is and this is what it looks like. So at the top, these are these are called beacons, right? They're calling back. So it's a dot, I'm on the dot 12 uh, as an admin and I'm sitting there and I believe I'm going to limit to the dot 10. So at first I'm gonna remotely dirt, because that's a good red team or a pen tester or whatever, you wanna make sure that executable is there before you just call limit commands to target. Because that's that's a no-no. C dollar Windows is very two, I'm during it. Who oh, it'll come up, and scroll up, I'll see a turtle. I should have filtered, I didn't. It was bad. <laughs> I'm lazy. So turtle. Turtle I see, and the next one I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the Linux process call create. To control that you see, and then I'll get a shell back from dot ten. So it'd be like hiding payload on target. And later on, like we're, we're going to services and schedule tasks, actually creating them remotely in the column. This is just utilizing one. So I do shell. One, oh, it's dot eight. Oh, I'm going after the DC. All right, DC is dot eight. Domain controller. So I'm doing a process called create. I hit it in the Windows System 32 directory of the domain controller. Chapal is created in that. You guys should probably definitely cap capture that. Right. And this will get published on YouTube, I believe. And then you guys can see this and do it yourself if you want. You guys have trial versions of Cobalt Strike. You're like, this is paid, right? You can download it and do this. So I'm calling it, and now we get a call back. I sit there, I forget it's a SMB beacon. Everybody knows what that is, so um, does anybody know why I would use an SMB beacon over a normal beacon of 443 or 80? No? Okay. So Probably do, you're just being quiet, it's fine. So, uh, SMB beacon, so like uh, 445, right? <laughs> well, I'm assuming. But like, so SMB beacon is like 445, right? So, like, um, but you do like 4445 or like a high, random high port because your DC communicates with other hosts over SMB, so that's normal traffic. So, if your domain controller is calling out over 443 or 80, guess what? Like, yeah, it's a huge red flag. And the hacker, who are the guys dumb? You should get fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, what, you know. Not for real. <laughs> it's not for real. Like, okay, server, server, okay. server 2016. I've done it. I've done it. So I should get fired, right? <laughs> server 2016 <laughs> has uh, internet access turned off now. There's not right. a Oh, no. So if you try doing that, it's not going to work or it's going to get flagged right away because, yeah, why are you, you know, browsing through, you know, cat pictures on your DC? Like, do that on your own computer. Not in three RDP session. <laughs> so <Thank you>. uh, <laughs> now <laughs> going into uh, scheduled tasks. Um, so right here, we're <laughs> going to go ahead and create a task on target. Um, and uh, so some of these uh, flags right here, uh, we're running it once immediately, and then the target that you're trying to run it on, and the RU is going to be the user that you're running it as. So you can either run it as system. The, you know, a domain admin, you know, whatever you choose, um, and whatever works best for your target. Um, you're gonna run it, and then you wanna go ahead and delete it after it executes, because why do you wanna leave stuff behind? After Unless you want it for persistence. Unless you want it for persistence, yes. Generally though, you know, especially like on, you know, workstations, you wanna stay there some way, but you don't wanna be loud about it. Uh, here again, um, we're showing in Cobalt Strike um, how to create the schedule test on the target remotely. We do this just so people like follow along and actually do this at their home. And I apologize, I'm not in Cobalt Strike every day, so some of the stuff going on here at his lab network, not 100% on. So. Yeah, you're just naming it Turtle. You name it Turtle, and then you're, you're calling for the Turtle that you see when the system 32. You're saying run it once, do it now, which is start time, and then 1.8. So slash s is usually always remote. And then the r slash r, you always think run under. I don't think it means that, but you're running under whatever permissions level that you're specifying. So I'm saying run system, run under system. So we're gonna, we're gonna call back a system to this. So, all right, go ahead. <laughs> all right. 
And now we're also. Uh, it's fine. Okay. The schedule, you, then you call the schedule task, it calls back, you have a beat. All right. All right. And then also, we're uh, showing how to uh, create services as well um, on our target. So, uh, shell sc slash slash your target. Um, again, it's like going, you know, in the file explorer to an admin share, you know, slash slash your target, you know, same, you know, uh, or whack whack. <laughs> so, and again, unless you want persistence, make sure to delete the service after it runs. These are very similar. Yeah. That's super important. And I'll always, always query your services. Well, from a ranking perspective, always query your services before um, putting a service on there because you want to make it very similar. So you look at all the services, and then you'll make one very similar to the others, and you give them descriptions. And you check. You can you can remotely check descriptions. You can do a, a SE query. You can query SE, you can query schedule task, all that, and then you just make it really blend into uh, the target environment, and you timestamp it and everything. And then security through obscurity, and then you know breaking in through obscurity doesn't really rhyme as much, but you know the sense is still there. <laughs> <laughs> So this is just creating the, the remote uh, service. So it's called I Love Baby Turtles. I named it. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Xcubles Turtle I used. Super. I can't rename Xcubles this on Ops. So this is like my, my happy time. I actually do stuff like this. <laughs> All right, that's what I do for fun, whatever. It takes a minute to call back, which is super annoying for this video. I was going to speed up, but I was lazy. <laughs> Normally, red teamers are pretty lazy. All right. So it creates. It's true. Sorry, that's true. No, no, no. It's going to call back. All right, so then you just kick off the uh, service remotely. Oh, yeah, sorry. Can't help. There you go. So I'm kicking off shell SC, start whatever, I love big turtles. And we'll get a, we'll get a beacon back from that service executable. So like, if there's if there's a service on on a, a target machine, we can leave a service exe on a target that we made that we time stomped that blends in well for persistence, and we just won't touch it, and we'll we'll leave it there. And we'll and like imagine like we'll leave a bunch of scheduled tasks and services. Or like, what what I would do on an op maybe would be to put something on the desktop. If I knew that I was getting flagged and people knew I was there, then I would put an executable on the desktop, and then I would create a scheduled task and a service. And I would timestamp blend it in as what like as best as I could. Because then like whoever the blue teamers would be like, oh, stupid red teamer, I know they're like, especially if they know we're there. Especially if they know we're there, like, stupid red teamer, I'm the best. And they'll go report it and I'm like, oh, you yeah, caught me. You, you know, but, like I have system level persistence, still two different system level persistences. I'm like, no, I'm so <laughs> stupid. You're so smart. And then I mean really I still and it's not fair. It's not fair to a lot of blue teamers, to be honest. I feel really bad sometimes, and it's not it's not fair to them, but it is what it is. So like, if you see something blatantly obvious, most likely, you know, it's a distraction away from what's actually happening to me. But there's a callback on .8. I can see the top of the system. Boom. Sorry. <laughs> Some shells. Right. And then so, uh, again, running a PS exec through an interpreter now. Um, you know, basically, it's going to work the same exact way that it would through a PowerShell window. Um, but again, if you're calling Yep, so you're uh, setting the RO uh, through the interpreter sessions, uh, just like you were uh, doing anything else, any other exports. Yeah, you can text. You just run them yeah. yeah, so I mean, you're going to be able to run everything through the interpreter uh, and using, you know, PS6X power, um, but on the network that you're trying to compromise, and they already have compromised. Yeah, you should always monitor for this. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody know what I, what I did wrong, or what we did wrong there? Can you see it? What's really oh, stupid yeah. of me that would get flagged? It would get caught in a second. Yeah, never use port 4444 with interpreter anymore. Yeah. So I would have gotten flagged in like two seconds in real life. Have I done that? Yeah, maybe. Um, probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Is it a distraction? Yeah, duh. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, whatever helps me. So now, uh, WinRM, so Windows Remote Management, it's another way to laterally move. I love this meme, it's super true. 
Windows Server Security, Key Power Enter. I'm sign out of cop. I think it's very relevant and uh, true today. So a lot of people, like super nerds, they're going to come after me and talk to me and be like, port 5985, even though it's unencrypted, you can send encrypted traffic through. This is just previous experience. Like, congratulations, you're right. You can't send encrypted traffic through that. But 5986 is for encrypted. So you can actually scan and see that, and then use the actual commands you run. I don't do videos for all of them. It'll work. You move remotely as long as that's available. There's ports. You can scan them and that, whatever. Okay, next one. Uh, remote registry. Let's do run with the register. So remote registry needs to be enabled. And then I'm showing that goat.exe is on the target. It's on a Robin. So run time. So, so here I'm just going to show creating a remote registry key and then kicking it off remotely. Right? So a lot of times this will be in uh, HKLM or HKU, right? Current user you're running under. Um, and so a lot of times you'll, you'll query those registry keys before. And especially after you create registry key, you want to query it to make sure it's there. I don't believe I do in this video because I pasted it. So I'm not bad. So you get your ID, you'll see reg add. So I'm going to say, so reg add, Batman Con, this computer I'm moving to, I'm on Robin. And then um, HKLM software, Microsoft Windows, current version, run. I'm naming it Wolf. And I'm saying call the goat.exe, which is on the desktop, which no one ever put that on desktop, but it's there. Usually you hide in Windows System 32 if you're a higher level user. But for registry keys a lot, you'll do uh, user level persistence. So you would hide it into C, yeah, C users, whatever folder you, you prefer that has files in it, and blend it in. Time stop it, blend it in. So then this is me showing that, or damn, we're going to be so this is me remotely restarting the machine. So I do shutdown slash M, I think you do slash S2, and then the target computer, the host name, Batman.com. And I think right team build manual, but I do tech R, tech F, tech T, zero. So I'm saying like, you know, restart force now times zero. And then um, <laughs> and then uh, I exit it because I'm lazy and I need to start another um, listener. And then I start a listener and now it's sitting here. So I'm listening on a, for, I'm listening to my dot six on 8080, I believe. This is a target. This is what they see after it restarts. So it just rebooted. It's sitting there. And this is what it looks like to a, a user. So you saw that a little flash in the circle. That's all they see. And then you'll see I get my shell. Boom. Right. And now I'm on that box. I can do whatever. Batman. Yeah, super cool. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, I'm going. All right, maybe the next one. I'm just wrong. I don't know around time. Oh yeah. All right, so maybe cat. So maybe cat super important. Important. It uh, it's used on like every op normally. So there's there's login passwords and do proc dump stuff and then do mini dump. Um, this is what it looks like. So doing um, doing mini dump, getting login passwords, set your LSA, login passwords. So it queries the LSAS, which is local security something access subsystem, something like that. <laughs> you can Google it. It's something like that. I forget the exact acronym, but it's, it's querying your, your hashes, which are so it's up your NTLM, SHA ones, and it'll actually give you clear text on target. So cool story that everyone loves to hear. So it's the first time I got domain admin. Why well, I hope you here. But it's the first time I got domain admin, right? And the cool thing was uh, I called it RDP Inception. So I had default credit to an admin account, I found out. Got on the machine, I found a file server that hadn't been restarted in like five years. So I'm like, okay, domain admin's been on there, whatever. So um, there, we couldn't get remote code execution with any of the cool tools of Cobalt Strike or anything. Nothing would work. So I was like, you know what? Um, Windows this internal suite has prop dump and it's Windows sign. It's not going to fly. Whatever. So I RDP through RDP to the target, and I share, I map my share, and then I drop Windows this internal suite with prop dump on the target. I ran prop dump against the target. I made a mini dump file with LSAS. I then pull the file back and pull the file back. I call it RDP oh, yeah. Inception, no big deal, it's pretty cool. Pull it back, and then, uh, <laughs> and then it, took, it took like four hours for me to realize though that, and this is like troubleshooting, like learning, I had a 64 Cali GM, and the target was a 32, the file server I dumped the mini dump file from. This is like probably showing I'm younger, because the older guys would probably be like, you idiot. Different architecture. And uh, it took me like three hours to realize, I kept trying to do, I kept trying to do the mini dump file and like get the creds out, and I was on 64, so I had to move it to a 32. Uh, XP VM that we just had to run uh, the mini dumpkins, uh, min, or to mini cats, mini dump all I had to pull the cred. So then I had to mini that, right? Super cool, super awesome. That's my story. But the next one. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> so responder. So we can't talk about louder movement without responder. And all right, so more stories and stuff. So responder is a super useful tool. L and R, link local, sorry, I remember. Link local multi relay name relay or link local multicast name relay. And net bios something T name server. Anyways, L and R is a successor to uh, MBTMS, right? So what's the difference? The main thing is they're two different ports, like one's like one three seven, and there's like five five three, five five, something like that, or something like that. But L M and R is IP4 and IPv6. Alright, the other one's just IPv4, and that's what you really need to know. But it doesn't really matter, responder will work with both. So responder will capture the hash and you can do different things with it, and we're gonna talk about that. But for a lot of people they'd be like, well we have port security, right? Which is <laughs> super fine. Usually like a lot of people at uh, companies they'll be like, we have port security, uh, Ethernet can pull three times and plug back in. I'm like, well that's really stupid, but good go on you. Like you you pass policies, right? But like if I go to a uh, if I go to a site, and this you know this is real life. So I got to a site, I go up to the switch that I get a lot of access to, right? You know, like I do close access teamwork, really like it's like lighthearted. So I'm in there, I'm up to the switch, I unplug the Ethernet, I plug the Ethernet into my attack machine, I then run mini or I run Wireshark and or TCP dump, I get a MAC address, I clone my MAC address to that of the Ethernet that I pulled out, I plug my attack machine into the switch port of the Ethernet I just pulled out. Now I'm the machine that I pulled out. So now I'm allowed access. And because port security does three, I only did one, what's the point? Like I don't I never understand it. But whatever, like you're passing policies, you don't need whatever. So now I'm gonna so now I'm gonna responder. And then there you go, next one. And this is a respond responder running on like default. So sorry. Oh, maybe just go back twice and then Yeah, excuse me. There we go. So this is responder running on default. So responder runs, and then um, you'll show. So this is the victim machine. So it tries to access a network resource that's not available. So it's going to create. It's going to query out to DNS or whatever. It's going to be like, dude, where's this network network resource? And I'm like, hey man, send your hash to me, and I and I push it forward. I'm like that's me, not right. That's what actually happens. Like, Rabbit Seven actually has a really funny video about this. I like watching. Um, so this is responder running. He tries to access the network resource. I call it food. I think I was really hungry while I was doing these videos. And then you'll see I have a hatch. All right, go to the next one. We're going to figure out a few while. I'll show you the LS, the domain, and then whether or not SMB signs on or off. Super useful. That's built in to the command as well. I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name, the main tool, so I'm not going to try. It's scary. But. So if I did the dot 12, you'll see SMB signs false. Dot 10 it's false with dot a which is to make sure SV sign is true. So SV sign can stop uh, passing the hash and like responder and all that, right? But all of you probably have uh, older systems in your environment. And then Samba, right? And so SV signing can be implemented. If you have Windows Server 2003, they tell them you're not. So and that's what they always say, turn on SV sign, and you can't. So this will still work. So it's kind of fun. It's still the upgrade for the next one. Um, all right, so you guys want to relay. So I want to say I got this working on the first try every time. It's not always true. And it takes a while, and especially like I have this running in the background while I'm doing a lot of other stuff. And this is more like pen testing than red teaming, but it still works really well. So yeah, you can do um, you can do the web proxy. So you can actually do tech WPAD. So if your browser is set to automatic, then you can actually it always calls on the WPAD dot in TDS or NIDS, some something like that. And then I forget the extension, the exact extension, but. It'll call out to that, and then I'll be like, yeah, man, that's me. And then I'll get actual, a pop-up will come up from the computer. I can force a pop-up to get the clear text credentials, which is really cool. But um, go to the next one. And then, wait a second. On this one. So for this one, uh, utilize the responder with multi-relay. And we're throwing a lot at you in a really short time. That's why this video, but um, you have to turn off HTTP and SMB and responder.conf, which is a configuration file on your cabin machine, all right? So by turning those off, multi-relay uses those protocols. And um, you can actually specify what machine that you want to go after and what user you want to go after it with. So you can do all users and all machines, or you can do, I think for this one I did uh, one machine, all users. So go ahead. It goes quickly. So the victim, well actually no, I'm going after dot 10, I'm using dot 12. So SMB's off, HTTP's off, and you can use Vim, Leapad, whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with. And then, um, I'm going to use dot 12 to go after dot 10. So now I'm going to run my multi relay, I believe. Yep. I ran a help just so you can see the syntax and everything. And it's kind of hard to see. But so you do attack you, administrator, attack you all. If I did multi relay, attack T, I say I want to exploit the dot 10. 
I want this computer, this one's in my target range. I want any user, so any hash that goes across that um, I capture as a responder, I will then pass to the dot ten to try to get a shell. That's what that means. So it checks automatically when you run it, it has to be something's off, because it'll let you know error. You can't you can't run multi-relay against that target. So now I run Python responder on each zero, so my interface, I'm running it, SV, SVHP is off. Now over here, I'm gonna try to access a network resource called uh, hi everyone, or something like that. Yeah, hi everyone. So I run it, boom, poison, shell on dot 10. So this is dot 12, and I pass the hash from dot 12 to dot 10, utilizing multi-relay, and respond at the same time. A lot of people are like, I know what a responder is. Well, like a lot of people, if you they know what a responder is, but I've never seen them like first time just sit down and do this. So that's why it's on the video and explain. Okay. All right, so port forwarding. Um, everybody's heard of it, whether it's with uh, networking, hacking, or gaming, um, especially the gaming. Guilty. Um, we uh, a lot of times it, you know you'll see it in Metasploit. Um, then you'll start uh, setting up the port forwarding. Um, basically, so that you're sending uh, traffic to the box that you're working with, uh, your attacker machine, and then you're uh, sending all that traffic and forwarding out to the box that you're trying to attack. So, how that works is, okay, you call into, you know, um, pharmacy or the hospital, and you're like, I want to talk to the pharmacy. So you hit one, and then that internally transfers you over to who you want to talk to. That's like the only way that I was ever able to get this straight in my head because it's still like really confusing to try to say and explain other than that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, you can also uh, do port forwarding with stocks. Um, this is uh, super. Phone call? Port forward, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I was going to so answer. A lot of times, like, you, you'll see this uh, set for uh, like tour. Um, use this a lot. Yeah, again, we're talking about running out of time. Yeah. Okay. Let me show them. Click it once. So over here, you're going to edit your uh, proxychange.com file, so your configuration file for your IP and port you want to utilize. So for this for this instance, we do uh, socket 4, 192.168.1.6. I think it's 8,000. It's hard to see. Over here, you just type socks 8,000. So through that beacon, you're then gonna, any, anything you run through your attack machine is gonna then go through your beacon to your target machine, right? And something else to think about, just, just go like one step forward, further, is like reverse port, so like, it's very important for your infrastructure, you have EPSs and reverse port forward, and that goes into this, like port forwarding. So you buy, buy a bunch of EPSs, set reverse port forwarding to your team server, your attack machine, so you have SSH, so like SSH, space so attack capital R, space, the IP of the VPS, colon 443, colon your attack machine, colon 443, space root at your VPS IP, enter, and then you do the password, or you, do, you can do keys as well. Then any callbacks you have will go through the VPS back to your attack machine, and that way if you get burned, it's just your VPS, not you. So that goes in this. Um, another thing, uh, especially um, uh, with port forwarding, is so you set up a WordPress site, generally I'll uh, have MySQL with that, I'm not sure if it's the same way with, with uh, MariaDB, but MySQL will have remote access uh, for administration turned off by default. So to get around this, okay, say you have the database running on one server and you have your uh, web server up here. Web server is gonna be externally facing because having a website that can't be reached from the internet, kind of lame. So to get to that database, so you port forward through the compromised web server that you have access to, and then port forward for 3306, which I believe is my SQL's uh, port, and then uh, you just sit, send all the commands through that to the MySQL database. So all of a sudden you pivoted from the web server over to the database. Back. So real quick. Yeah, yeah you go through. All right, I'm gonna fly through this because we're running out of time. Is, all right, so set up, so a lot of people mess this up for attackers, so I just wanna go through this, just in general for people to know. So in I said in, I created a mess like payload for Windows, whichever, or CCP. Then you say listener, exploit multi handler, dot six, listen for eight six eight six. Next one. Hosting payload. So this is what, so a lot of times when you hear physical access team or like cat team, what actually happens is this is what's happening in the pack or background. They have a public facing web server that they're hosting, a Python module, some HTTP server that's hosting their payload. 
So this payload could be something that actually usually is passed, it's just a zero day and or a payload that I know will get flagged, like a C-sharp one that's made or whatever, then it'll actually have to have a password or something. So it's just in the payload, it's public facing, and then when I plug in a Fast Bunny, then it'll call out to the web server to then run my implant on the target that will execute and call out. So that's what they go in, they plug in USBs to targets, right? But it's seen as a keyboard, right? And Python makes it super simple with the you know simple HTTP server uh, module that they have. You just set that up in your Kali box, boom, you already have a web server. Done. Good. Yeah. So then here's here's it running. I get a call back from dot ten. And then um, this is uh port forwarding. So like the way I always think about it is like when I took OSCP is like um, I do I I did port forward from my four four five to the target's four four five, so it was vulnerable to eternal blue. Right, SMB. And then, um, so I, for the R host and Esploit, I tapped myself. So I set my IP in the R host, I tapped my 445, but I knew it forward to the target and I would get shell back from the target. Hopefully, if you did it right. Yeah, yeah. which <laughs> I've explored myself a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, we're almost done. I'm trying to fly through to the next speaker. All right, so <laughs> it's a lot of information. I feel bad. So um, we're at the end, we're getting there. So like Bloodhound, you can't talk about a lot of movement about Bloodhound, Spectre Ops guys, they're super awesome, right? So every slide, super cool and nifty. So this is a, a graphic, you know, database management. So this is me connecting my Neo4j, I started Neo4j, it's just always head bouncing, I like it, it makes me happy. And then um, this is you, act, so PowerShell and Bloodhound, so this is me running Bloodhound on target using PowerShell. So really cool note that a lot of people don't know, you actually utilize is you don't have to drop files on target. What, with Bloodhound? You can actually use, uh, you can do PowerShell embed Bloodhound, I think it's like tag U and then tag P, and you can actually do like new, Neo4j, Neo4j, space, the attack machine's IP, colon 7474, but you have to do a reverse port forward before you do that. So then when you attack, so when you run Bloodhound on the target machine, it actually pulls all the Bloodhound data through um, your attack machine to your Neo4j. So it's just all that data, so you don't have to drop dot zip on target, it actually just goes, hmm. I've done that. On um, ops, I, I didn't do this video or anything, but yeah. So boom, not on disk. You know, yeah. always stay away from being on disk. Okay. But Bloodhound's still super normal. I would never run Bloodhound on, or Power Up, to be honest. On machines today, but whatever. Because these guys are super smart, so I would never challenge them. But um, and this is what the output looks like in Bloodhound. I'm sure all of you seen. Oh, I hope you all have seen this. But domain controller is red, right? Users with admin privileges, and then um, all the other groups and stuff. Super pretty. And then uh, I had to do references because I don't want to steal people's information or talk about their stuff without giving them their credit because they're really smart people. Um, one other thing too, a uh, special shout out with the references, uh, Silent Trinity, um, Black Hills Information Security. Uh, oh, yeah. Marcelo did a talk on bringing your own interpreter into a target environment. And that right now is like the best way to get around any PowerShell blocks that AMSI or Windows Defender have set up. Because basically you're touching the .NET information and you're going right to that, and you're bringing your own interpreter, so you're using Iron Python or Iron Ruby all of a sudden, and then scripting in that language, not touching disk, getting around all the PowerShell blocks, and you're good. Um, so, Silent Trinity, uh, Byte Leader, um, he's up there uh, in the references list. He just updated on like 443 as well, yeah. so I think it was the like only. It's super awesome. Yeah, he's, he's super smart. Yeah, I'm super trying to get on his level. So then, and these are all the handles. And there's Dwight, who's my favorite person in the office, of course. So yeah. <laughs> and these are all the people who really influenced me, and like I, I, you know, I talk to and stuff that help help me grow. But then, if you enjoy this talk, I'd like to know more. Dwight again. <laughs> That's the Facebook question to scare me. But here's the Facebook <laughs> questions you have. Oh. You can talk to me after, but yeah. you can also ask publicly. Um, yeah, and you can check out my GitHub. I have a few things on there. I work on some other stuff. And I'll collaborate with anyone. So if anyone does like C Sharp, PowerShell, um, you know, I do C++, PowerShell, or I said PowerShell, and aggressive scripting, and hit me up. And, uh, I'll game with you. Yeah, I'm like the Steam. It's right there. Just add me on Twitter. All right. And that's it. All right, but So, all right, thank you so much right now. We'll do questions in the back because we don't want to be disrespectful. So, all right. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oh, right. 